As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. Hello, everyone. You are watching TikTok Live because it is Thursday night, and we are coming together tonight to glorify our King, Jesus Christ, and our Father in heaven. We are so glad that you have decided to join us tonight. I want to encourage you all, um, while uh, before I do the welcome and stuff, I want you guys to be pulling up your Twitter account or um, clicking on that Facebook share button above the player at TikTok TV and get ready to do your synchronized tweet. Type out a little message um, telling everybody how much fun we have here, what's going on. We've got a live broadcast going on and invite your friends to come and join us. Okay, so get that ready um, while we're talking. While you're doing that, I want to say hello to all of you new people. Please feel free to get on the chat board and say hello. Even if you're not much of a chat person, we still would like to know that you're here. And um, I want you guys to... Um, also, be sure to sign up for the TikTok TV Twitter, and um, you're going to want to also sign up to our Facebook because we have a whole lot of stuff going on, a whole lot of exciting things coming up. Um, some of you are aware that we're getting ready to start the Dallas Morning Show. We're gearing up to do a major fundraiser um, where we're going to be going live 24-7 with uh, just, you know, reality TV on steroids, okay? You guys can see what we do every day. We're going to be raising money for the mission that God has sent us on to Dallas, Texas. Going to tell you more about that at the end, hopefully, if we have time, which we usually don't because there's so much teaching to do, which is why we're going to get right to that. But first, let's do the synchronized tweet. I want you guys, um, on the count of three, we're all going to send out our tweets, okay? Three, two, one, tweet. And off they go into the cybersphere, and hopefully they will bring people to us if you are watching anywhere besides www.tiktok.tv. Definitely go on over there because that's where everybody's meeting, and you can, you know, see what's going on, see where the action is, okay? And um, we are going to get right to the teaching tonight. Just stay tuned till the end, and I might have time to tell you a little bit about all the exciting things going on. You are going to want to be signed up for the Twitter and stuff, though, because that's where you're going to uh, be able to stay in the loop. Okay, tonight we have a lot to cover um, because we are talking about heresy, heretics, false teachers, the danger of judging the teachers. Now, all of you guys um, have heard so much about you know, heresy. You've got people hunting heretics. You've got heretic hunters. You've got people calling themselves watchmen all over the place. Very popular. You know, I'm a watchman. And sometimes, you know, um, that can be a good thing. But a lot of times what people mean by that is that they think it's their job to tell the whole world that they've identified who the false teachers are and, you know, to expose them and tell all the bad things about them. Okay, so we're going to talk tonight about heresy hunting, um, being a watchman that watches out for apostasy or watches out for um, for heretics and um, and that kind of thing and why that first of all is not scriptural second of all it's not effective and third of all can be very dangerous to your spiritual health and um, I'm not only talking um, to the leaders who may be watching who are engaging in this kind of activity but also to those of you who subscribe to those kinds of people who have friends that are like that or who are engaging um, in that kind of behavior because that's what your teachers do so on your Facebook pages or on YouTube or um, in your personal life you're doing the same kind of thing you think it's your job to expose false teachers okay um, we are going to get down to what the Bible says about that tonight all right it's going to be a good night, a lot to learn. So let's get right to our first question, which is, should you judge teachers? And are there eternal consequences to judging teachers incorrectly? Okay, so we're going to do that first. Should you be judging people who claim to be teachers who are from God? Okay, now. If you're going to be judging a teacher, you've got two possibilities, right? If you're sitting as a judge and you're saying, this teacher is good, this teacher is bad, right? And the, those, those are your two possibilities. You're going to judge them to either be good teachers 
or you're going to judge them to be false teachers or evil people, right? Um, people who are sent by Satan. False teachers. First of all, let's talk about what happens if you judge them to be evil, okay? If you judge a teacher to be evil and it turns out that you're wrong, okay, you may be condemned for that. And I'm going to read this to you in Scripture. Now, understand, um, I, we're talking about judging the person, okay? And we're going to talk about judging the teaching in a minute. But we're talking about judging the person, saying that person's from Satan, um, saying that God wants to call down judgment on that person, um, wishing or praying for bad things to happen to that person, um, uh, you know, uh, ranting and raging against that person, uh, trying to bring out their sins and expose their sins for everybody to see, spreading gossip about them or whatever, whether, um, whatever, what, whoever it is, it doesn't matter. Um, judging that person to be evil or bad or not from God when they say that they are, okay? We're going to read Luke ten sixteen. okay? It says, he who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me, but he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Now, this is what Jesus said to the people that he sent as teachers, apostles, disciples, people that he sent to the body of Christ, um, the leadership, okay? He said, basically, I'm giving my authority to you. He said that in many places. God has given me a kingdom. I'm going to give that kingdom to you now. Whatever, um, however people treat you, I will count that as how they are treating me. And Jesus said that many times to the people he sent. So when you are judging teachers to be evil people, um, I want you to keep in mind the fact that if you accidentally judge someone to be evil and reject them and it turns out that they are sent by God that you are mistaken then that mistake can cause you to be condemned because it says that he who rejects me um, he who rejects you rejects me when Jesus was talking to the people that he sent okay so um, when you decide that you on your Facebook page um, are going to let the whole world know um, that a certain teacher is evil, a certain teacher is, fa teacher is false, a certain teacher is bad, then understand you're putting yourself in a position as judge over that person. And if it turns out that you are not right, then you are not just rejecting that person, you are rejecting God. Okay? Now you may say, well, I feel safe, uh, you know, uh, doing that because I know that what they're teaching is false. We're going to talk about the fact that in a minute that sometimes people that God sends are wrong about stuff. And I'm going to show you many exa examples of that in Scripture. So don't feel safe just because you know, well, they're teaching a false doctrine. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're bad or evil or not sent by God. And you're probably going, what? What are you talking about? I'm going to show it to you in Scripture here in a minute. Okay? Just keep that in mind. If you accidentally judge somebody to be an evil or false or bad teacher, and it turns out they're sent by God, then you have not only rejected them, you've rejected Jesus Christ. Okay? So, number one, sometimes righteous people, even teachers sent by God, don't have perfect understanding of Scripture. All right? By their words or actions, they may advocate teaching and uh, beliefs that are not right or incorrect, or they may have an approach that's not in line with God's will. Okay, now you may be saying, how can that be? You know, how can you say that? Okay, I'm going to give you several examples of people who didn't have complete understanding of Scripture or um, who did things maybe not exactly in the right way or who had a bad theology, okay, but they were sent by God. First of all, let's talk about Apollos. Apollos was a man in the book of Acts. You can look him up. Um, he was a, a wonderful, um, somebody who was a wonderful speaker. He would go into the synagogues and he would show them in the scriptures. Um, he would prove to them through the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. He was the Messiah. And it says that he was doing a wonderful job um, making that case in the synagogues. However, he only knew about John's baptism. He wasn't aware of the baptism in fire and the Holy Spirit. Okay. And so his understanding was incomplete. Yet God was already using him. Understand that. He didn't know everything, and yet God was already using him. Um, his doctrine was, at best, not complete, okay? 
but he was doing a great job and he was sent by God. And so what God did is he sent Priscilla and Aquila, who were other servants that were, um, it was a husband wife team. There were servants in the Acts church and um, they heard him in the synagogue and they took him aside afterwards and they, um, they gave him a more complete understanding, explained to, the, to him about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, um, you know, helped him along in his Christian education. Okay. So that's one example of a person who had incomplete theology um, or a bad theology, you could say, but that was sent by God. Now, I want to point out to you that this very issue is something that divides the body of Christ today. There are some people, let's just take like um, a real generic um, example. You've got Baptist type people who don't believe in um, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the way that we see it in the book of Acts and the manifestations that we see um, of the gifts of the Spirit, okay? We've got those kind of people over here, and then we've got Pentecostals over here, okay? I'm just making this like a, a really broad example. Um, many times, people who are Pentecostal will reject people who are Baptist because they don't understand they say they don't understand the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, there is more to the baptism in the Holy Spirit than just the outward manifestation of speaking in tongues and, and the things that come along with that, okay? And we're not going to go into that teaching right now, but what I want to point out is the fact that today, many times what would happen, because there are divisions and denominations in the church, which is against the will of God, it is against the word of God, OK, um, if you are involved in a denomination and you hold to those denominational lines and you reject other members of the body who don't belong to your denomination, you are not in God's will. You are in disobedience to the word of God. OK, and that is what would happen in this situation. Many times a Pentecostal would reject a Baptist as a leader or as somebody being sent by God and might even call them a false teacher. Why? Because they didn't understand the baptism in the Holy Spirit, according to the Pentecostal. But what did they do in the book of Acts? Did they reject Apollos? No, they didn't reject him. They took him aside, and they explained it to him more thoroughly, okay? And understand that even before he had understanding of it, God was using him, and he was sent by God. So, um, if you were to reject Apollos, guess who you'd be rejecting? The one who sent Apollos, which is Jesus Christ, Example number one. Example number two, we've got Peter. Uh, Peter, there are a couple of examples with Peter. First of all, um, with Peter's theology. Um, Peter had bad theology before Jesus died, and actually all of the apostles did, because Jesus kept telling them, you know, I have to be killed by, by the, um, the teachers of the law and um, the, the leaders of the synagogue. I have to be killed by them to fulfill the scriptures. But they didn't understand what he was saying to them. They didn't understand. Uh, they didn't believe him, really. Um, and uh, it, it just wouldn't sink in. They, they could not accept what he was saying. And Peter um, took that to the extent that when Jesus told him that he had to go and um, be killed and raised again from the dead, uh, Peter tried to stand in the way. Because you have to understand, uh, these apostles had um, the mindset, that really the same mindset that the Pharisees had in some ways um, concerning prophecy and how the Messiah would fulfill that prophecy. They thought that the Messiah was going to be a political leader um, that came along and that became the king of Israel. And then that Israel would, you know, uh, be um, really have domination on the earth. Um, politically and that people would come to worship Israel's God but they thought that Jesus needed to become a king okay and of course Jesus did become a king and he is the king but it just didn't come about in the way that they understood it because they could only see about that much as a picture right but when Jesus died and w um, rose again he explained it to him okay but the point is up until the time that Jesus um, died and was raised from the dead and explained to them um, what was going on and open their minds to the scriptures up until that point in time they had bad theology to the point that they tried to stand in the way peter did tried to stand in the way of god's will by saying to jesus he took him aside and he said this is not going to happen to you it's like i don't want i don't want to hear this stuff about you dying okay this is not going to happen to you and jesus had to say to peter get behind me satan because you don't have in mind the things of god but the things of man okay so that's i mean that's bad theology when your theology leads you to a place where you're going to try to stand in the way of God's will, that's bad theology. Does it mean that Peter wasn't sent? Absolutely not. Jesus had sent Peter out. Um, before that, he had sent the 72 out. He would breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. 
And he'd sent them out to the towns to cast out demons and heal the sick and to preach the gospel. And they had the power and the authority of God, not only after their theology got corrected when Jesus was raised from the dead, but before their theology got corrected. So here you've got 12 guys with some bad theology that God sent. And actually, it was at that time that Jesus said, Um, this, the scripture, he said, he who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me, but he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. He was saying that to the disciples when he sent them out to the towns and villages in Luke 10, you can go look that up. Okay. So again, if these people rejected these 12 guys that didn't have complete theology, even might say they had bad theology, they were still rejecting Jesus. Why? Because their authority was not based upon the fact that their knowledge was completely correct. Their authority was based upon the fact that the person who sent them was the king. He had the authority. And so they represented the king. And so if they were rejected, then the the person was also rejecting Jesus Christ. Also, Peter, another example. Um, After Jesus was raised from the dead and went up to heaven, um, when Peter was in charge of the church, okay? I want to point out that spiritual leaders... And many times, um, you know, th- this is when you're talking about heresy, heretic hunters, false teachers, and all this stuff. Um, you know, there are people, and you may be one of these people, who think that it is a ministry to um, pick apart the leadership in the church and um, point out the, the whatever splinter they might have in their eye, okay? And to criticize um, not only what they teach, but the way they do things. Okay, but I want to point out to you that spiritual leaders don't always do things exactly correctly. That doesn't mean that they're not sent by God. That doesn't mean that you can judge them to be evil or not from God. Okay, and that's what we're asking. Should you judge teachers? Should you judge them? Okay, Peter. Here's an example. Um, Peter and Paul um, were together in the same place. They were with some Gentiles, okay? And the Jews weren't supposed to associate with the Gentiles, but in the body of Christ, um, God made it very clear to Peter specifically that God had accepted ne- the Gentiles now and um, that he was bringing them into the fold as well, into the sheepfold, and um, that he had sent Paul the apostle to the Gentiles, but that they were to be accepted, right? But the Jews wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. So what happened is that Peter was was cool with that. He was down with that until some of his Jewish friends came around. And then he started separating himself and sitting apart from the Gentiles, kind of treating them, you know, like they're separate. Now, God does not stand for separation in his body any more than you would stand for something, come on something, someone coming, pardon me, with a hacksaw and hacking off your arm. Okay, this is the body of Christ. So it's not acceptable to have divisions um, between the brethren, uh, between the brothers and sisters um, in the body and the family of God. All right. So when Peter started doing this, it wasn't the right approach. It wasn't the right thing to do. It was hypocrisy because he'd been teaching that the Gentiles and the Jews were now one in Christ, in the man Jesus Christ, that we had become one. And yet when his Jewish friends came around, he kind of started pulling away. Right. And doing that that, um, elitist separatist thing again. And Paul had to call him on it. He said, hey, listen, that's not the right thing to do. That's hypocrisy. You can't do that. You know, he did call him on that. But that doesn't mean that Peter was not the head of the church. It doesn't mean that he was not sent by God. It doesn't mean that he was evil. And it doesn't mean that um, he wasn't to be listened to and obeyed because the words that he had been entrusted with were Jesus' words. Okay, just because he did something wrong or uh, got something wrong doesn't mean that he, you know, anyone was now free to to judge him, um, that everyone in the body was now free to reject him. Okay, you can't just reject somebody because you found out that they made a mistake or they did something wrong or, you know, they sinned. Right. Yeah, I I got news for you guys. You're not going to find a spiritual leader out there that doesn't deal with sin. Ask the Apostle Paul. He talked about his struggle with sin, how sin was always, uh, you know, he he was always fighting with it. Okay? I mean, this is is a problem for anybody that is living in a fleshly body. And it says in 1 John that if you claim to be without sin, you, uh, you claim that God is a liar. You make God out to be a liar. But if you confess your sins, then God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of your unrighteousness. Okay, so if you're looking uh, for a spiritual leader out there that's never going to mess up 
uh, not going to find it. <laughs> if you're looking for a spiritual leader that's always going to have all their theology exactly correct, uh, I got news for you guys. You're going to have a really hard time finding someone like that in the Bible. Okay, but just because you can find fault with somebody doesn't mean that you can judge them to be evil and doesn't mean that it's your job to tell the body of Christ that they shouldn't listen to that person. Okay, because if you make a mistake and if you reject somebody that God sent, some imperfect human that God sent, then you are not only rejecting that imperfect human being, you are rejecting the perfect lamb of God who sent them. So be very careful. I'm going to give you another example. James and John, the sons of thunder. There was a, a certain town that rejected Jesus. They got really mad about it, and they had a very human response. They wanted to see the power of Elijah, and they, wanted, they said, Hey, Jesus, should we call down fire from heaven on this town? You know, they were indignant because these people didn't, didn't respond appropriately to Jesus. And Jesus rebuked them. And he said, you don't know what spirit you are of. I didn't come here to, to condemn. I came here to seek and to save people. See, they didn't understand the plan. Okay, now you're going to see that all over the place right now. People given words that they claim are from the Lord, saying that um, this false teacher is going to die or that, you know, uh, calling down judgment, God's judgment on different things. Understand that's what James and John did. Okay, and yes, there is such thing, such a thing as the wrath of the Lord and the wrath of the Lord is prophesied in scripture. It's not anything that we need a special word from a special prophet to tell us about. This is the authority right here. And it tells us what the, um, the judgment is going to be on the nations and upon people uh, ultimately who do reject God. Okay, but understand that Jesus came to show us what God is really like. And it said the Bible says that. Man's anger does not bring about God's righteousness. A lot of times we get, you know, very self-righteous in our anger. We're going to defend God. We're going to defend God's character. And we think that our anger towards unrighteousness is holy anger. And when we do that, we don't understand that our sin, the sin that God can see that still lives in our heart, is just as putrid to God as the sin in somebody else that we're getting angry about. Okay? And... Jesus came to show us um, an image of what God is actually like. And the Bible tells us what that character is. He says, um, don't think that God is slow in keeping his promises. He, is, um, he delays his judgment because of his mercy. He wants to give you more time to repent. So, you know, James and John, they're like, okay, we're ready. Judgment right now. Call down the fire from heaven. We want these people dead. But Jesus showed them that that is not God's nature. That is not what God wanted to do, and that's not what God sent Jesus to do. He sent Jesus to make a way for people to be saved, and God is patient, and we need to be patient too, okay? So when you feel yourself getting all bubbled up and all fired up and thinking, I don't want to see God's wrath coming down, and I'm going to speak it into existence, you've got to understand that that's murder in your heart. That's not the spirit of the one who laid down his holy, righteous life in order to buy those lives, the lives of those sinners. Do you understand? That's a different spirit. That's why he said to James and John, you don't know what spirit you are of. They thought that their anger was righteous and that, that it was of the spirit of God. It was God's righteous anger, but it wasn't. It was the spirit of the world. It was the spirit of murder, okay? And I, I want to point out to you that John... Um, Later on, I mean, he, he mellowed out, you know. <laughs> he became um, all about love, all right? And he came to understand that message. But we need to understand that message too. You shouldn't be so anxious to call down um, judgment on people who are wrong because understand that we see many examples in Scripture of people who have been so wrong and yet God has been able to bring them to repentance. You see, um, you know, Paul the Apostle was killing Christians. He was, his name was Saul, and he was a Pharisee, and he was going around town to town, and he had gotten um, permission from the spiritual leaders and letters of permission and authority to go from town to town and find the Christians and persecute them, have them thrown into prison and even killed. Okay? So that's, like, that's really evil. <laughs> that's really bad. And that's why one of the reasons, I mean, God used Paul to show the riches of his mercy and his grace. Paul became one of the greatest people. He was an apostle. He wrote uh, much of the New Testament that we have today and the testimony of Jesus Christ that we have and of his words. 
or he chose to use somebody like that so that we would understand. You know, there were probably a couple of people that wished that God would kill Paul. How about some of those people who lost family members, who had family members put in prison? Don't you think it would be pretty easy for them to look at Paul, who was then Saul, and say, God, I pray that you would bring him down. Bring him down into the dust. I pray that you pour out your wrath on him. Don't you think that would be pretty easy to respond that way? But God has taught us. He said, you don't, you, you don't curse your enemy. You bless your enemy. That's a very difficult thing to do when you're actually in that situation. Now, the truth is, many times the people that we're condemning have never done wrong to us personally. Right? We're just being judgmental. But even if that person has wronged you personally, understand that that could be. You may not be able to see it. Right now they may just be a murderer and a horrible person. But because of God's mercy, that person could possibly be brought into a place of greatness in the kingdom of heaven. Someone that could be a person who would pour out their life to preach the gospel to people. You don't know what you're looking at. And that's why the Bible says you don't judge before the time. And that's why we should not be anxious for God to pour out his wrath quickly. Okay, if you love somebody, you want to give them more time. You want to give them a chance. You see them as someone not who's evil, but who has been taken captive to do Satan's will. Someone who is blind and deceived and needs to be rescued. That's what Jesus saw in the people that killed him when he was on the cross. And that's why he said to God, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That should be your attitude towards the false teachers. Okay. Yeah, they may be leading a lot of people astray, but understand that these things are prophesied and you're not going to stop them. Jesus said that there would be false teachers that would lead many people astray. You're not going to stop that from happening, okay? He said his sheep know his voice, so you need to just teach the truth, okay? But um, that's, that's another example, the sons of thunder. Job, one more example. Job was a righteous man. It said so at the beginning of the book, at the beginning of Job. Satan went and asked God for permission to take everything away from Job, to kill his family, to afflict his body um, with, with disease and sores, uh, to take away all of his wealth in one day. Because he said, you know, yeah, Job is, is righteous now. He believes in you now because you've given him everything. But he'll curse you if you let me have my way with him. Okay, so God said, okay, go ahead, Satan. Just don't touch his life. Satan took everything away in one day. It was horrible. Well, Job's friends came along, and guess what they did? They judged him. They looked around at this terrible catastrophe that had happened in his life, and they said, well, there's no way that this would happen to you unless you, we know that you have secret hidden sins. We discern it. You know what I mean? You know that people, I mean, maybe you're one of these people, you know, you look around at circumstances and then you claim that you're having discernment when what you're really doing is guessing, okay? <laughs> I think that you are being judged by the Lord. Well, that's really easy to say, isn't it? But you don't necessarily know what you're talking about because I want to point out to you what happened to Job's friends. Job was a righteous man. And in the course of his trial, he did say some things that he got rebuked for because he he, you know, didn't think it was fair, and he told God, you know, I want a trial. I want to know what I did wrong. I don't think I did anything wrong. I want my day in court, basically, you know. And, you know, but he did not cross over the line and curse God. He blessed God. He worshiped God. When he found out all of his family had been killed, he, he shaved his head. He got down in the dust, and he worshiped God. So God honored him, okay? Okay. In that process, he made some mistakes. Guess what? God himself came, appeared to Job, and he rebuked him for the things that he said that were wrong. God rebuked him. But guess what he did to the, the guys that were rebuking him, his friends that had come and accused him of some secret sin, that they were just sure that he had some, you know, some terrible sins in his life because they, you know, in their wisdom, they could see that God had judged him. You know what God said to them? He rebuked those men and he required they had to bring um, a sacrifice and have Job make a sacrifice on their behalf just so that God would forgive them. Do you understand that? So be careful, you guys, when you're looking at uh, somebody and you see uh, some spiritual leader and you think that there's something wrong with them and catastrophe falls on them. Be very careful about saying, hey, that's a God's judgment. You know what? Guess what? If you're wrong, you're going to be in the position of Job's friends. Okay? So, you, you know, you, you have to understand, you are looking at this from a very limited perspective. 
And if you will do what God tells you to do and have the attitude that God tells you to have, you'll be safe. But if you take matters into your own hands and you try to establish some spiritual authority uh, for yourself by claiming that, um, you know, you can call down God's wrath on somebody or by claiming that um, you have the authority to um, spread gossip about this teacher over here because, you know, they're teaching false doctrine, so now anything goes. Guess what, you guys? Just because somebody's teaching false doctrine doesn't mean that you have the green light from God to gossip about them. It doesn't mean that if they get a divorce that you get to post all the articles about their hairy, nasty divorce on your Facebook page. What makes you think that that's okay? Because they taught some false doctrine? Now they're open game? Well, guess whose heart just got exposed? Because someone who has love in their heart doesn't want to expose somebody's sin. What they want to do, love, what does love do? It covers a multitude of sins. Now, we are to expose evil, you guys, but that is different from attacking a person. And it shows that you do not have an eternal mindset and you don't have the mindset of Christ. Look at, um, look at Jonah, okay? Don't have that attitude, you guys, that Jonah had. He resisted God. He didn't want to prophesy repentance. Um, he didn't want to preach repentance to Nineveh because he hated them. He wanted them to die. He wanted God's judgment to come upon them. And, you know, he resisted God. Finally, he submitted to him, went and did it, and guess what? They repented. And so Jonah goes out and waits for God's wrath to fall down, and it doesn't happen because they repented. And Jonah was mad about it. You see, he was stubborn in that, okay? And I'm not trying to judge Jonah. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you guys, God said to Jonah, hey, there are thousands of people in this city. Should I not be concerned about them? And that's what he's saying to you. This, this preacher that you have as the poster child, evil preacher, I made that man. I made that woman. What makes you think it's okay with me if you slander them and, and air their dirty laundry, laundry for everyone and tell everyone that, um, that you've got their number and that you're going to call down my judgment on them when you have sin yourself? I love that person. You should be praying for them. You shouldn't be praying for God's judgment to come more quickly. Pray for Jesus to come more quickly. <laughs> but don't be praying for God's judgment on that person to come more quickly because you guys... God gives people time to repent because of his mercy, and you should want to do the same thing and understand that hell and eternity in hell is a very long time. And if Paul can be turned, sometimes some of these people can be too, okay? So be very careful, all right? I'm going to give you another example. And this is a really good one of somebody who did not have his theology right, did not really know God, um, did not have information, correct information about God, but he was honored by God, okay? And um, some people, you know, he, he was God-fearing. We don't know exactly what God he, um, what he believed about God, but he certainly didn't have information like the Jews and the Christians, Okay. But this man was named Cornelius, and you can read about him in Acts chapter 10. Okay, I'm just going to read a little bit of this, not the whole thing. Um, I'd love to read the whole thing, but I think you guys need to just go and read it on your own so that we can get through a little more teaching tonight, okay? I was going to read it, but I'll let you read it. I'll just read the first part of Acts chapter 10 to you. It says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Okay, and then it tells a story of how Peter had a vision. And this is where God revealed to Peter that the Gentiles were also going to be included, along with the Jews and God's people. And then God sent Peter to Cornelius' household. And this was all supernatural through angels. Okay, this is an amazing story. God really interfered here. Understand, on behalf of this righteous man named Cornelius who didn't know, didn't have information about God. And he sent Peter to get the right information to him. And so Peter, Peter preached the gospel to them. And God, 
showed that he was there and that he approved of them, that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit. They all started speaking in tongues, just like the first time that it came down um, in the book of Acts. Okay. And then Peter and um, the people with him, they acknowledged. They're like, okay, God has given them the Holy Spirit too. We can't deny that they have been accepted as well. Okay, so here's another example of somebody who didn't have all their information about God. Correct. Okay, they didn't have information. They, but what they did have was a righteousness before God. God looked at, the, at Cornelius' heart. Okay, and he saw his gifts to the poor and his prayers. And those things came up as a memorial before God. And God is the one who made sure that Cornelius got the information that he needed about God. Okay, and I want to use this um, to point out to you guys that many times when we do um, heretic hunting and heresy hunting and all that kind of stuff, um, pointing out all this stuff, we are not trusting the fact that we have a God that is not dead but alive and that the teacher that teaches us is the Holy Spirit. Okay, understand that. There, you know, it says that, that Jesus has appointed some people to be apostles and, and, you know, teachers and prophets and different things, okay? But nowhere on that list is heretic hunters, okay? Heretic hunters are people who hunt human beings. That means they have a spirit of murder. Do you understand that? Because a heretic, no matter what you may say they are, they are human. So someone who hunts heretics is someone who hunts humans, okay? And classically, if you think that that's a stretch... Go and look at your, um, your church history books, kids. <laughs> you seminary students should know it well enough. The fact of the matter is that historically in the church, um, you know, as, as these old wineskins have gotten uh, toughened, right, by the traditions of men and have become more and more resistant to the word and the spirit of God in the institutional church, we have seen that um, they acted just like the Pharisees. Anybody that didn't agree with their theology, they call them a heretic, and then guess what they do with them? If they had the authority to, they kill them. If they didn't, you know, shun them, ruin their reputation, you know, threaten them, try to scare them, whatever. But certainly, m there have been millions and millions of people who have been killed by the church, whether Catholic church or Protestant church, happened in the Protestant church too, okay? And these were people who would scream heretic. Usually the people screaming heretic are people who have murder in their hearts in some form or another. They may not um, go out and literally murder people, but they do slander. And understand that you can kill people with your words. You kill the reputation. And um, you, through gossip, you destroy their relationships. Okay? That's exactly what Satan did to God in the garden when he told Eve, God, no, God didn't tell you the truth. You're not going to die if you eat that. If you eat that forbidden fruit, he's just trying to keep you from becoming as great as he is. See, Satan planted gossip in her mind. That's a very, very evil thing. That's the sin. Um, that, that was the iniquity that caused the whole world to fall into sin. So God says that slanderers don't enter the kingdom of heaven. And if you think that just because you see someone's faults, that then that gives you a green light to slander them, you're wrong. Because everybody has faults. And the Bible says that, um, you know, bitter water and sweet water, it can't come out of the same mouth. It says, you know, with, your, with one mouth, you, you bless God, and then out of the same mouth, you curse people that God made in his image. It says, brothers, this should not be, okay? So when you say bad stuff about people, um, you're not doing God any favors because God made that person. You're talking about his son. Remember the prodigal child? Remember that story, the prodigal son, the father um, who had a son that was good, that stayed and did all of his work and, and was faithful to his father. But he, then he had an, a son that was wicked and took all of his inheritance and ran off and spent it all on prostitutes and, and wild living. And then he was left destitute and he came back home, finally got the guts to come back home, thinking he'd just be a slave in his father's house. And his father ran out, ran out to meet him. When you look at your... Um, your, your teacher, the teacher that is your favorite teacher to hate, okay? Your favorite teacher to slander. Next time you look at them, I want you to look in that face and understand that that is God's prodigal child. That is somebody that God loves. And all the people that are following them, those are his children. So be careful about what you say about the king's sons and the king's daughters. 
You can't judge whether that person is, is an evil person that's going to go down to hell or whether that is a Saul or a Paul. You do not know, so do not judge before the time unless you want to have judgment fall on your head. Okay? So the question, should you judge teachers to be evil? The answer, right there in Scripture, okay? If you judge, it says very clearly, if you do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Okay? Now, let's talk about judging teachers to be good. If you judge a teacher to be good, is that, do you, you know, should you do that? Okay? Actually, I'm going to read to you what Jesus said about that. It's very interesting. Um, I will say that if you're going to say something about somebody, then pick something good. If you have a choice between saying something good and something bad, say something good. Find something good to say that's true. But if you are going to say, this person over here is a good teacher and you should follow them, okay? I'm going to show you that you kind of need to think about that in the same way, okay? Because Jesus said this. I'm just going to read to you. Mark 10, 17 through 18, okay? It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. And then Matthew 23, 8 through 12, Jesus says, But you are not to be called rabbi, talking to the leaders of the church, the apostles. Okay? <laughs> he said, You are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher the Christ, the greatest among you will be your servant. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Now, what I want to point out to you about here is um, when you make yourself the judge of the teachers, what you are doing is you are putting yourself in a position that is higher than a teacher, okay? Or at least on the same level as a teacher, okay? So understand that you're putting yourself in a position, you may not even think of yourself as a teacher. Maybe you do, okay? But you do need to understand this is a very serious responsibility because it says not many of you should presume to be teachers. I'm going to read this to you. It says not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. Okay? And then it says a student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. So whenever you make yourself the judge of the teachers, what you're saying is you are either at the same level of a teacher or above the teachers. Right? And so you have exalted yourself to that level. So understand, you now have the responsibility of a teacher. And you will be judged like a teacher. I want that to sink in for just a second, okay, you guys? Because some of you have blogs where you think that it's your job as a humble lay person to point out who is a good teacher and who is a false teacher. And many times you'll switch teams just like that, okay? <laughs> you'll have people that you thought, well, I used to think this person was a good teacher, but now I know that they're bad. Well, listen, you guys, understand, when you set yourself up in the position of a judge, first of all, you've just raised the level of accountability that you have to that of a teacher. Even if you don't want that responsibility, you just gave yourself that responsibility because you're now trying to move and lead the sheep around and telling the sheep that they should listen to you to find out who to listen to. Okay, so you've put yourself in that high position. Now, some people have been given responsibility over the church to guard them from wolves and stuff like that. But please, if you don't, um, if you know that God has not appointed you to be a teacher, and if you don't want to be judged with that, um, that strict judgment that is reserved for teachers, then you need to understand that it is not your job to be judging teachers. Okay? Because you put yourself in that judge's seat. Also understand that it is God's word that is supposed to govern us, not people. Okay, that's what Jesus is saying here. You're not to be called the teacher. They're not supposed to be looking to you as the leader. Now, these are the leaders of the church. It says that in Acts Church, they devoted themselves um, to the teachings of the apostles. 
Okay? So, yeah, they devoted themselves to listening to what the apostles had to say, but what the apostles gave to them were Jesus' words. Okay? They walked around with Jesus. They uh, listened to, to the words that he said. He entrusted them with his words, and those were the words that they spoke. Okay, so they were simply pointing people to Jesus, just like it says the Holy Spirit comes and does what? The Holy Spirit points us to the words of Jesus. It reminds us of Jesus' words, right? And, to, and glorifies God. So even though, you know, I may be a, a teacher in the body, Jesus has appointed me as a teacher, I don't want you looking to Monica and saying, okay, Monica, um, give me the answer to all my questions because, hey, what happens when Monica's no longer here? <laughs> you know what I mean? Are you going to be able to stand on your own two feet? Not if I've trained you to look to me as your teacher. You are to look to this as your teacher because this is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, anyone who takes my words and puts them into practice, they are building on a solid foundation. So then Jesus had that same wisdom. Even when somebody called him a good teacher, he said, don't call me good. Nobody's good except God alone. You see, a truly good teacher will not point to themselves. They will point you to God's word because they understand that they are just a servant bringing you God's word right now, but that God is the one that makes things to grow. God is the one who makes sure that all of your needs are provided. It is the anointing that comes from God, according to 1 John, that is going to teach you, okay? And it's not that person that gives you life. It's God's word that gives you life. So any good teacher is not going to tell you, listen to me, and I will tell you who is on the good list and who is on the bad list. I'm going to tell you who the good teachers are and who the bad teachers are. I'm going to tell you which denominational teachers are um, okay to listen to and which denominations are, are bad to listen to. Okay, when you put yourself in that position, you have just exalted yourself above Jesus Christ himself because even he didn't say that. He said, don't call me a good teacher. Okay, who, why do you call me good? Nobody's good except God. So it's okay to acknowledge that <coughs> if you have a teacher that, that consistently teaches God's word, to say, hey, I get fed over here. This is the person who, who gives me God's word, and, and they do a really good job speaking God's word. But don't put authority in that person's opinions or words, okay? Understand that you should be teaching people, if anything, um, pointing them to always test everything with the word. And that's what we're going to talk about next, okay? We're going to talk about the difference between judging the teacher and judging the teaching, okay? As we said before in Matthew 7, 1 through 2, it says, Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. 1 Corinthians 2.15, though, then says, The spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. So how do you make those two things work together? Well, you understand. One um, is talking about the teacher and one is talking about, um, other, you know, not the person, but spiritual matters or spiritual things, okay? So you should be making judgments as to what is good and what is evil. But understand that we do not fight with the weapons of this world. We do not fight against um, flesh and blood. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says that we have a mighty weapon. We have mighty weapons that um, can tear down strongholds, spiritual strongholds, okay? But we don't fight our spiritual war by slashing every false teacher that comes along because you have to understand that these principalities, these evil desires, these evil things, they're going to pop up in many different places, okay? It, it's like a weed. If you think that you're going to defeat the problem by pulling, pulling the, you know, the stalk off of the weed, it's not going to work because the roots are all down in there, okay? Spiritual warfare is done with the word of God and slashes at the principality and the root itself. It says that this gets down to the very root of the matter, okay? It gets down to the bones and the marrow. It is, it is sharper than any double-edged sword, and it cuts the heart, okay? It gets to the heart of the matter, and it, it, it gets out that root, that root of evil, okay? And so you're never going to win the war by, you know, on your website listing all the wolves and then all the people that you have approved for people to listen to. First of all, you set yourself up as a judge, bad position to be in. Unless you're perfect, okay? Second of all, you have just taught people to look to some human being to tell them who they should listen to and who they shouldn't instead of looking to the ultimate authority, which is God's word. And you do not want to be exalting yourself above God's word. 
If you are a good teacher, your, your students will know everything that you know. Okay? You're not going to keep them in a position where they have to keep coming to you to get their knowledge. No, you're going to say, hey, listen, go find it. Go find out for yourself. Go get a relationship with Jesus yourself, and I'm going to show you how to do it. And then you're going to make disciples. Okay? Um, then those people will know Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ will set them free. So you don't judge the person. You don't judge the heretic. You don't judge the false teacher. You judge the teaching. Okay, now what this does is it allows us to reject evil and to reject error and to tear down everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, to tear those things down without rejecting the human being that that error or um, that evil even has come through. Okay, sometimes it's just error, like in the case of uh, Apollos or Cornelius. Sometimes it is evil, like in the case of uh, Saul, who became Paul, who was killing Christians or having them killed. Okay, but whatever it is, we don't want to reject somebody, ultimately, that God has sent. Okay? Now, I want to show you real quick the fact that um, that we um, actually, in Scripture, it was expected that not everything that came forth in, um, in the church assembly, whenever they would get together, not everything that came forth would actually be good. Do you realize that? You know, they'd get together. I'm going to read to you about kind of just a little excerpt out of 1 Corinthians 14. But, you know, I mean, Paul had to deal with them on this because their, their services got a little out of hand sometimes, you know. But, you know, God has this way of correcting us. It's no big deal. Okay, if we think everything's going to always be perfect and we're never going to make mistakes, you guys, you got to understand we come as children. We come to God as children. The Bible says that God uh, winks at our ignorance. We're little kids to him, okay? So, yeah, we're going to have misconceptions, and we're not always going to do things right. It's not the end of the world. You don't look at somebody like that and say, you can't be part of us. You can't be part of me because you don't have all your information right or because you don't do everything just exactly the way that I understand that it should be done. You don't separate I mean, even if you have, if you have a, a part of your body that's sick, say you have a really bad cut on your finger, okay? You don't say, oh, you're blemished. I'm cutting you off. <laughs> you don't do that to your own body, and you don't do that to other members of the body of Christ. If there's something wrong, if there's something in error, if they're a part of the body of Christ, what you do is you, you bandage it. You put medicine on it. You take care of it. You, you treat it gently. You treat it with special care. You don't just chop it off, separate from it. Do you understand that? Okay? can't afford to be chopping parts of your body off. You can't do that very long before you're dead. Okay? That's why the Bible says that in the end times that the church would be like ten virgins who were asleep. That means that they're dead. Okay? That's, that's the expression that Jesus would use when somebody was dead. They're asleep. All right? That's why it was prophesied. Okay, and that this division has happened in the body of Christ. But what he's doing in the end times is he's waking us up. And that, you know, just like Ezekiel's, um, uh, or the, the dry bones, okay, that all came together to make one body and then God breathed life into it. That's a prophecy of the church. So that's what we're seeing happening. And we're learning how we're going to have to get, get along even though we don't agree on everything. And even though some people may have some stuff really wrong, it doesn't mean they're not a part of us. We've got to take care of people, you guys. We have to pray for people, love people. Okay, I'm going to read to you um, 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 29. What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at most three should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. Now, wait a minute. If the prophets were always right and always saying something that's from the Bible, then why would they have to carefully weigh what was said? Understand that it was, uh, that it was known that sometimes when people would go to prophesy, that they would not always be speaking um, 
what was from the Spirit of God. Now, there is a difference between prophesying and being appointed as a prophet. The Bible says that if you are a prophet, if, if somebody claims to be a prophet, that if they have any prophecy that doesn't come to pass, that they are not from God. Understand that. There is no room for error if you are a prophet. But the Bible also says, you know, Paul said, I wish you all would prophesy, okay? Meaning to, to bring forth a word, a word from the Lord, okay? But the reason that we have to weigh those things when people speak um, what they say is a word from the Lord is because sometimes your own thoughts get mixed in with that, okay? Sometimes it's an imagination. Sometimes it really is God speaking to you. And sometimes it's, it may even be a demonic um, influence, okay? That can happen to anybody. But that's why it has to be weighed. And what do we weigh it with? We weigh it by the standard. If it's not in the Bible or if it goes against the Bible, then we have to throw it out. And that's what it says to do, you guys. It says that. It says in First Thessalonians 5, <clears throat> it says, <clears throat> pardon me, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. Okay, so do you get that? That means that he understood, that the author understood that there were going to be um, people who just want to say, we're not going to do this tongues thing anymore. We're not going to do this prophecy thing anymore. Forget this. Because why? Because sometimes error comes forth in that process, okay? And so it's really easy to just make a rule, and that's what some denominations have done. Well, God just doesn't do that anymore because it's too messy. You know what I mean? And that's why Paul had to give this instruction. He said, don't put out the Spirit's fire. Don't treat prophecies with contempt. See, he foresaw this problem, okay? But his, the solution was not throw it all out. Don't allow prophecy, don't despise, uh, or to despise prophecy. That wasn't the solution. The solution was test everything, hold on to the good, and avoid every kind of evil. Okay, understand that even though there was some error that came forth from some of these examples that I gave you in the Bible, that there was a lot of good that came from them because they were sent from God. So what you have to do is you have to hold on to the good. But if you see Peter over there and he is separating himself from some of the members of the body and being an elitist and being a separatist when God said not to do that, not sitting with the Gentiles, you don't hold on to that. Why? Because you test it by the word of God and you know, hey, no, the spirit told us that those Gentiles are part of the Jews, that we're all part of each other. That's what God said. That's what the spirit told the church. And so you test it, and you say, well, that's not good, so I'm not going to do that, even if it's Peter. I'm not going to do that. But it doesn't mean that you then judge Peter and say, you're a false teacher. Mm -mm. <laughs> he was still the head of the church, man. I mean, he's not the head of the church. Pardon me. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Peter was not the head of the church, but he was put in charge of the church at Jerusalem. Okay? No man is the head of the church. Not the pope. Not, a, not your senior pastor. Okay? There's only one head, and that's Jesus Christ. But this acknowledges that sometimes you're going to have some bad mixed in with the good. You don't throw the people out. You don't throw the whole idea of prophecy out, but you just test everything, and you hold on to the good. You don't have to freak out because everything didn't come, you know, to pass, and then you just throw the whole baby out with the bathwater or whatever. You just test everything according to the Word of God. If you do that, then guess who your teacher is? Your teacher is Jesus Christ. The word of God. And you are on a solid foundation if you'll do this. Now, really quick, I want to tell you guys what you need to do. If you want, um, if you want to um, know what your job is. You know, if you thought all this time that your job is to expose what's wrong in the church and expose false teaching and expose heresy and expose heretics. Okay? We've just learned from the Bible that that is not a ministry. Okay? There are apostles, there are prophets, there are teachers, but there are no heretic hunters <laughs> that Jesus has appointed, okay? Now, if you are a shepherd of God's people and you are laying down your life, giving away all your money and living a humble life and giving your life away in order to preach the gospel to people, then yes, you have worked hard among them. And yes, you do have a position where you can lead them and guide them. If there are people that come into the camp that are teaching wrong things, you can identify that, okay? But I'm going to read to you. Um, how you're supposed to handle those people, okay? But first of all, what you want to do, if you want to um, be effective, okay, 
Heretic hunting is not going to help anybody to become anything good because what it does is focus them on the wrong thing. If, focus, if you focus on heresy, if you think that you're a watchman and you're watching for apostasy, you're watching for heretics, you're watching for wolves, you're watching for evil, guess what you're going to find? If you're seeking evil, if you're seeking apostasy, heresy, all these things, guess what you're going to find? You're going to find evil. But if you want to find good, if you want to find righteousness, then you need to be the kind of watchman that is watching for the morning, that is watching for the sun, that is watching for the, the dawn, that is coming, the sun of righteousness, the son of God. Okay, focus people on Jesus Christ, not on what is false, but on what is good. And how you do that is you become a disciple. Jesus said, this is the way you become a disciple. You obey Jesus Christ. Okay, he said, if you hold to my teachings, then you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, okay? And <clears throat> we, it is always, um, if you really want to teach people what is good, it is always going to be through discipleship that they really learn, okay? So if you want them to know how to follow Jesus, you need to use many less words, and you need to be speaking God's word through your actions, okay? As it says, Paul said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Okay, and it says anyone who claims to be in Christ must walk as Jesus did. Your job is not to criticize what other teachers are doing wrong. Your job is to do it right. And if you do it right, people can look to your example, see how to do it, and do it the right way because you're going to be pointing them not to you but to Jesus Christ by doing the things that Jesus did. Okay, and I'm going to end by reading to you how you can, um, how you can handle heretics. Okay, how God wants you to handle heretics, because there are people that are going to come in that are going to be wrong. They're going to be causing problems and all that kind of stuff. But it tells you what your attitude should be so that you don't get judged. Okay, so that you don't fall into their sin. And um, <clears throat> this is Second uh, Timothy, chapter two. It says, keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best, and these are instructions to Timothy, okay? Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. I want to stop there and point out that his job um, was not to argue with these people, but to simply be a good worker himself, okay? Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. And then I'm going to skip down. It says, um, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Okay, that's what you guys need to understand. If you're dealing with someone that opposes you, you need to be dealing with them gently. Okay, and you shouldn't be resentful towards them. You should be compassionate. Remember like that wounded finger? You need to take care of them. You need to pray for them. You need to bless them. You need to be gentle. You need to use less words. You don't need to quarrel. You don't need to slander anybody, but you need to be a good example by doing what the servant of the Lord does, handling the word of truth correctly, being a disciple so that people can follow that example and in doing that they will be following the example of jesus christ okay well i hope this has helped you guys today i um have a prayer request here um fn okay we're going to pray for fn and he has cluster migraine headaches is that right cluster migraine okay and um so we're going to pray for fn and um then you guys are going to go and um meet in the fellowship room of course and have a good time so Let's all come together before the Lord and pray.
And um, also, this is going to be a good time for you guys if you have engaged in kind of some of this heretic hunting stuff and maybe slandered some people and stuff. It's just a good time to kind of begin this repentance process, okay? Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for helping to take the log out of our eye. Um, we are no longer interested in going and picking everybody else apart. It's easy to criticize other Christians. It's hard to live the life of a disciple and to live in humility and allow you to do your work in the members of the body and to correct them, Lord God. It's so much easier to look at somebody else's sin than it is to allow you to um, show us ours, but we want you to show it to us. And I pray that tonight that those who have been convicted, that they would not resist your discipline, Lord God, but that they would change the way that they're doing things and the way that they're using their words and um, begin to um, show love through their actions, through self-sacrifice, through, um, you know, just providing for people's needs around them and um, laying down their life for people as you did for them. Um, I pray that uh, that you would just make room in the hearts of the people who are here tonight for your word, Lord God, and that as a body you would bring us together in unity, in humility, understanding that no one is better than anyone else, no matter who has what knowledge, that we all love you and we are here because we are, um, we are bound together in that love and in that hope that we are your bride and we are going to see you very soon. You are our very great reward, and that is what we have in common, Lord God, and we trust that um, when we have an attitude of repentance, that it does lead us to um, understanding, Lord God, and um, that you you bring us to a place where we have right understanding, but we have to start out with a humble heart. So we humble our hearts before you. Um, I pray that you would help anybody who has wronged another person um, who thought that they had license to do that uh, because they were wrong in their doctrine or whatever, that you would help them to know what the correct way, uh, what the correct thing to do is um, in order to remedy that, Lord God, um, whether they need to go to that person and apologize, whether they need to um, say anything publicly about it, or whether they just need to move along um, in obedience going forward, um, in obedience to your word. But I pray that you would bring strong conviction upon the body of Christ the fear of the Lord, Lord God, that you gave um, to the Acts Church, Lord God, um, that you would fill us with that fear and that wonder and that awe that will move us into obedience and um, love for one another and love for you. We love you, God, and we thank you for your awesome and holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time tonight, you guys. I love you, and I want to encourage you to go to the community room. They're going to tell you how to get there on the board. Hope you guys have a great time, and until I see you next time, remember, read your Bible and do what it says.